Golden State Media Concepts Fantasy Football Podcast is your one-stop shop for fantasy football news and advice. Can't decide on who to draft on the first round? Going gaga on how to line up your team. Got you covered. Traditional leagues, dynasty leagues, PPR leagues, IDP leagues, IDP leagues, even daily fantasy football leagues. Join us as we break down all the questions of fantasy football. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Fantasy Football Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. And I am your host, Ryan Basulto. Guess who's back? Back again. Ryan's back for the Fantasy Football Podcast Network. Guess who's back? Guess who's back? And I am back as your host once again. And just when I thought that there wasn't any fantasy football news that was going to be I was going to be able to bring to you, besides my wonky and wacky segments, we have this week in the NFL. There's a lot of big news. Dak Prescott got signed. That's a lot of implications for other people. We're going to go through the biggest NFL news right now. Then we're going to get into tag you're it. We're going to see who got franchise tagged and who didn't and what are the fantasy implications for both. We're going to get back more into a bunch of more NFL news because a lot of people are getting signed, cut, not getting signed, contract disputes. And then we're going to end it with... My segment at the end, is it more believable than Baker seeing a UFO? I'll get more into that later. But first, we are going to turn it up and start talking about the biggest news in the NFL, which is Dallas Cowboy. Dak Prescott is now going to be a quarterback for four more years, $160 million per Adam Schefter. He's earning $75 million in the first year. Yes, let me repeat that. Seven. D5 million. This guy's crazy. He doesn't want to, you know, spread his money out more. Tom Brady, who we're going to get into a little later, is okay with taking pay cuts. He's okay with not getting all the money if that means you could build him a championship team. Now, Dak Prescott has been wanting this contract for about two to three years. It's the Cowboys' fault for the most part because all he did was want more than Carson Wentz and Jared Goff. And at the time, that was a hundred and something million dollars. He could have got 110 mil two, three years ago, call it a day. I mean, it wouldn't have paid out right now because they would have been he would have been hurt last year. It would have been a free uh, year of giving him money from Jerry Jones' end. But Dak Prescott finally got paid. Um, $126 million guaranteed, highest in the NFL. His... Yeah, signing bonus is the highest in the NFL, and it took three off seasons to do this, but they finally got it done. They paid Jalen Smith, they paid Zeke, um, they paid everyone else on the Cowboys team besides your boy Dak Prescott. And why is this so important? Well, not only is it a domino effect, and it's going to lead to other quarterbacks having to get signed or traded elsewhere instead of the Dallas Cowboys, it is also a Big impact on fantasy value. We have talked about this many times. Dak Prescott, when he is in, is a top three fantasy quarterback, in my opinion. Only people you put above Dak Prescott, to me, in fantasy football, are Patrick Mahomes. And depending where Deshaun goes, Deshaun Watson. That's it. I don't care about Kyler Murray. I don't care about Justin Herbert. I don't care about all these guys. And the reason being... Because, okay, the Dallas Cowboys defense is horrendous. And that is a lot of the reason why Dak Prescott was able to put up the numbers he was able to because he was on the field so much. That defense was allowing the third, there was the 32nd ranked defense, historically terrible defense. One of the worst defenses, at least in the first seven weeks, we have ever seen in history. (laughs) I can't even, you know. Make it sound bigger than that. It's history. Since the 1960s, no one, 1950s, whenever the NFL 
really started getting their defensive stats and, uh, and points per game allowed, the Cowboys are the worst. Cowboys just don't have what it takes to make it over the hump. But good thing this isn't the GSMC football podcast because I would be telling you how this would help the team, but they would lead them to a 9-7 and seven record and they did all this just to lead them. No, this is fantasy gold. Now everyone on the Dallas Cowboys can get picked up within the first three rounds. CD Lamb, third round pick easy. CD Lamb put up 900 yards last year and that was without... Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott only played the first five games, threw for 1,800 yards, number one in the NFL at the time. Yeah, he was dishing the ball out every time. They were having an average of 418, 88 total yards per game. Now, let's break this down. With Dak Prescott, they would score 31 points per game. Not 31 points per game. With Dak Prescott, he scored pretty much around 31 fantasy points per game when he was playing. According to ESPN standard fantasy football scoring. But they're 42 and 27 with him in that Cowboys offense. A winning record. And I know what you're thinking, ah, 42 and 27, that's not Tom Brady, but he's a Dallas Cowboy quarterback. Don't forget. Besides Tony Romo and then I guess Drew Bledsoe, they don't have much greatness all the way until Troy Aikman. And you can't even say Troy Aikman because they had Emmett Smith, Michael Irvin, and the greatest line and one of the best defenses along with Deion Sanders. So yeah, Dak Prescott is a key piece to this Cowboys offense when it comes to fantasy. With Dak Prescott, their NFL rank in points are first with 36.1 points per game. In passing yards, when Dak Prescott was there, 371 yards per game through the air for Dak Prescott. Number one in the NFL. What about total yards? I already said it. 488 total yards. Zeke is getting those open runs, those looks inside the box that people have, because you have to spread out your linebackers and safeties now that Dak's back. Because before it was Andy Dalton, and you're like, oh, okay, like I could stack the box and we'll take out Zeke. We'll do the Dalvin Cook method. We'll just stack the box. We'll do um, the Derrick Henry method. We're going to stack the box. You're not going to make me pay deep if we stack this box and we just blitz you all day and you're not going to be able to get any big plays without Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott also used his legs. Very important when it comes to fantasy value. A running quarterback. He's able to rush touchdowns. That's six points right there. That's as much as a running back. Dak Prescott was one of the best fantasy quarterbacks last year. And then he got hurt with that ankle injury against the Washington football team, and then it went, I don't want to make louder fart noises, because then it's just going to be yelling into the mic, but yes, he was just flat, the offense was just flatulent after that, without Dak Prescott, their points per game went from 36.2 to 6.5, 6.5, 6 freaking points, my baby sister could score more points in an NFL game than that, 32nd in the NFL, pass yards per game, 371? Shh, nope, more like 118. No, that's not a freeway. That is the amount of passing yards they were throwing per game. And no, this is not a stat from Otto Graham and Sammy Ball back in the day. Even they probably threw more in a game than what the Dallas Cowboys are throwing. 32nd in the NFL with their 118 passing yards per game. What about that total yards? 243. 32nd in the NFL. More than half. More than half. Of a deficit. Compared to when Dak Prescott is there. When Dak Prescott is in. C.D. Lamb gets value. C.D. Lamb's a top 3 receiver. Michael Gallup is a top 7. Uh, top 3 receiver. I mean a top 3 round receiver. You get De- Michael Gallup like in the 7th round. He's a top 20 to 25 receiver. Coop. Coop. Yeah, I'm annoyed of Cowboy fans saying that, but Coop gets great fantasy value. Dak Prescott, yeah, Coop was doing good, was probably one of the outliers and the only people that were doing good in fantasy, still averaging over 10 points per game if you're doing uh, standard ESPN PPR leagues. But Coop still took a hit. You get less red zone action. He doesn't have as many open touchdowns. Like I said, they stack the box more and they probably double bracket Coop over the top. 
You can't do that anymore now. Dak Prescott knows how to throw. They don't have Andy Dalton, Ben DiNucci back there. Ben DiNucci. Ben freaking DiNucci. Who would have thought? Not me. Not I. Dak Prescott makes that Dallas Cowboys offense so vital. Now they have everything locked in. They have CD to 2023. Jarwin to 2023. Coop, Amari Cooper to 2024. Zeke with that amazing running back contract that he was able to pull off till 2026. Jerry pays his players. He pays them. And actually, him and Dak got the deal done one hour before the trade deadline. One hour. So, I mean, it was coming down to the wire and Dak Prescott was not having any of it. I know that Dak and his camp wants to get it done because you could tell when Dak finally got his thing done, he was crying. He was like, wow. I can't believe I finally got this deal done. Zeke only had 979 yards and six touchdowns last year on 244 carries. Zeke doesn't get those stats. Those stats don't even make any sense. It's just, I don't know. I think that with Dak Prescott in the lineup, you get Zeke in the first round. You get Dak top five rounds. I don't get quarterbacks, but if you want an electric quarterback coming out right now, better to take a risk on Dak than anyone else because I think people are scared of that ankle injury, but if Alvin Kamara has showed you anything about these leg injuries, it doesn't matter, man. You'll come back strong. So literally everyone on the Cowboys offense, fantasy implications are through the roof right now. Through the freaking roof as long as Dak Prescott is there. Well, as soon as Dak Prescott comes in, it's it's over. But remember, no matter what I tell you about the Cowboys, for the love of everything that is holy, please do not get their defense. Their defense has still got awful. They only have Trayvon Diggs. They have no safeties. They need a draft in the NFL draft, which we're going to talk about next month for the Fantasy Football Podcast. Make sure you check that out. Little teaser right there. And yeah, don't get their defense. I did not say their whole team is stacked. I meant their whole offensive side is stacked. So stay away from that. The Dallas Cowboys get a big plus. And the reason why this is the number one news story I have to talk to you about, and I know everyone talks about the Dallas Cowboys, is because you need to understand Dak Prescott got his money, and when he's in that offense, that offense is money. Mike McCarthy, if you remember him from his Packer days, they'll go on the 2-3 yard line and throw the ball. They'll do a, a quarterback run on the outside. Mike McCarthy makes this so much easier for Dak Prescott to throw the rock. He'll throw 40 times in a game. It's beautiful. It's it's magnifique. Mag- Nifik. I need to start sticking to my own lane and start saying words that I only know. <laughs> okay, from one fantasy juggernaut to the other fantasy juggernaut, we're going to talk about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Adam Schefter reported that Tom Brady apparently wants Odell Beckham? The crybaby in Cleveland, Odell Beckham? I mean, it's kind of unlikely just due to Tampa's cap situation. I mean, they have to sign Shaq Barrett. They have to sign Chris Godwin. Did they franchise tag him? Did they not? I don't know. You have to figure out in the next segment. They also have to sign Levante David. Oh, wait. They did sign Levante David to a two-year, $25 million extension. So OBJ, he wants rings. And that's all Tom wants. And you know what's the beauty about Tom? Is Tom's going to spread the ball. He's going to spread it to OBJ. He'll spread it to Antonio Brown. He'll spread it to, if Chris is Chris Godwin back? I don't know. He'll spread it to Mike Evans. He'll spread it to Gronk. If OJ Howard was there, he spread it to OJ Howard. Sometimes, I mean, in the Super Bowl, if you're blitzing him enough, he said, hey, I'm just going to check it down to Lenny Fournette. Lenny! Lenny! Lenny and the Jets! Yes, Lenny Fournette. Check it down to him, Ronald Jones. I mean, if OBJ were to come in, Tom will make it work, but expect a 900-yard season at best. Fantasy implications here, I would still stay away from Odell Beckham. Odell Beckham last year, he only played, what, one, two, three, four, five, six games. He played six games. Gave you five fantasy points, 17 fantasy points, nine fantasy points. Gave you that 38 against the Dallas Cowboys when the Browns just completely train wrecked them. Said, ooh. Say stop, say uncle, say uncle, say uncle. That's what they were just telling the Cowboys the whole time when they were just on top of them, bullying them like a cousin who came from for a barbecue and is just ready to beat you up. And you're like, no, I just want to be friends, cousin. No, bully, bully, bullied. So the Cowboys got murked right there. And then they went. he went back to earth with the Colts with 10 
and then Pittsburgh Steelers four fantasy points. These are all PPR based because I like PPR. You get more points, points per catch, points per reception. These are full points, by the way. So Odell Beckham is not doing what he has to do in Cleveland. The only thing is I would give him credit that Steven Safansky is a great running coach. He's going to run the ball 60% of the time because he has two of the best running backs almost in the NFL, definitely top 10. And if you were going to worry about fantasy value, Kareem Hunt, you get him if you get Nick Chubb. I don't care if you get him round one, round two, you get both of them. They're both really valuable in fantasy. Easily Nick Chubb's a top for, uh, top uh, pick next year. Top five running back. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the Tampa Bay Bucks. Tampa Bay. The Tampa Bay Bucks. Man, that guy just goes good with everything, I guess. <laughs> oh, man. He's like the perfect, the perfect wine. The perfect wine that goes with all meals. Tom Brady never ages. Just gets better as he gets older. So... Odell Beckham, if he joins that Tampa Bay offense, he's going to be a, as good as Michael Gallup to me in fantasy. Here's why. I think that the Bucks figured something out at the end of the year. That they're going to win, especially championships, with that run game. And they're going to win with that defense. They were running the ball. They, gave, they had 369 rushes the whole year, not including the playoffs. It's a lot of rushes. If one running back had 369 rushes, you'd be like, whoa, that's that's a lot of rushing uh, rushing attempts for a total of 1,519 yards. That's not no joke number. That's not no, oh, hey, that's that's funny. That's cute how, like, the Bengals got, like, 400 total rushing yards combined throughout their whole team. No, that's a viable, legit number. 1,500 rushing yards, if that was a running back, he'd have a top, a top year besides Derrick Henry because he had a 2,000-yard rushing year. But any other year, that's a top Zeke year. That's a top, uh, well, I'm going to say Sean Alexander just to go old. Sean Alexander year. That's a top Christian McCaffrey rushing yards year. They figured out that they want to run the ball. Bruce Arians already said, like, verbatim, I want to run the ball 50% of the time at least. At least doesn't mean I'm going to run 50% of the time and that's it. It's like, oh, I'll try to run. No, we're, okay, so we're going to run, 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 run. Let's figure out we're going to pencil in the pass because we need to get those first downs, those chunk plays, and those big game yards that we need from Tom Brady because I know that he's electric and knows how to make the right plays, read defenses, and he's a perfect quarterback. The Tampa Bay in the red zone, the scoring percentage is 95%. 95% of the time they score. 95% of the time, every time. They score touchdowns on 42 of the 61 trips. I mean, they're pretty much almost electric in the end zone. These numbers aren't everyone's types of, of numbers. These are number one in the NFL in the red zone. Um, Evans going to get the looks in the red zone? Pick up Evans. He got 13 touchdowns out of 18 targets in the red zone. 13 touchdowns. You know what Evans does. Evans is the only guy I'm vouching for on that receiving core of the Tampa Bay Bucks that is going to do good in fantasy because he gets the volume in the red zone. Doesn't matter how much they run from the 20 to 20. You know when the red zone hits, Tom Brady's first look is, oh, hey, that guy's like 6'6 over there. Let me throw it to him. And he has great hands, so he's going to get it most of the time. Tom Brady is a guy who likes to trust people. If he trusts you, like he did with Julian Edelman, like he did with Danny Amendola, Wes Welker, all these all these scrappy receivers, he will give you the ball. James White. When James White won that Super Bowl for him uh, with the Atlanta Falcons, he didn't win it for him against the Atlanta Falcons when they had the craziest comeback in Super Bowl history when they came back from 28-3 to with two minutes left in the third quarter. They didn't just win because of James White. But James White was a big factor. He was making plays, breaking tackles. He was doing things unlike James White. So Tom Brady had a special play in his, place in his heart for him after that and would always try to look for James White. Odell Beckham. Is he going to get that same love? If he doesn't start getting the ball, is he going to start being a diva? Because I don't like diva receivers. I I stay away from diva receivers. Michael Thomas, Antonio Brown towards the end of his career, Odell Beckham. All these people, Chase Claypool, eh, I'll get more into him later, but all these people are divas, and I'm not really messing with it. Odell Beckham, his numbers have been declining ever since his Giants 91 catch, 1,312 touchdown season, 2014. 2020, speed up. I know he was hurt, but he had 23 catches, 319 yards, and three touchdowns. What about when he wasn't hurt last year? 74 catches, 1,000 yards, four touchdowns. What about the year before that? Six touchdowns. The year before that, three touchdowns. This guy doesn't get in the red zone. 
So where is this fantasy value going to lie if Tom Brady's passing it to Scotty Miller, Antonio Brown, maybe Chris Godwin? Check the next segment. Mike Evans, Leonard Fournette. Well, if Leonard Fournette walks, we'll see. But all these people, Ronald Jones, his tight ends. Tom Brady's a tight end guy. O.J. Howard, Rob Gronkowski. You forgot O.J. Howard was hurt most of the year. That's why they gave it to Cameron Bray, who's another guy Tom Brady is becoming best friends with. Because they're the best friends anyone could ever have. Yes, Tom Brady likes his red zone. And Odell Beckham, just looking at his red zone touches, he's it's not good. When he's in the red zone, his percentage of getting the ball is 13% last year, 16% this year, 25% the year before that, 50 which was a good one, but that's when he was on the Giants in 2017, one of his peak years, 21%. Odell Beckham doesn't get the targets. And there's a reason why he doesn't get the targets. He's a small guy, and maybe that's what Tom Brady wants because Tom Brady wants a shifty guy to do his drag routes, which are routes where kind of clap hands routes. You and the other receiver are doing shallow routes, which are like five routes and in. And then you're going across the whole field, kind of giving Tom Brady time to go through all his progressions, and then he gives it to you on the drag, which is a two-yard route. But knowing Odell Beckham's speed and athleticism, he can make it and take it all the way. But I think that the Tampa Bay offense has figured out how to win championship ball. And championship ball is great if you are when fa- in, fantasy val- in fantasy football, if you are rolling with Patrick Mahomes and their championship ball and how they sling the ball all the time and give it to two or three key guys and they get all their fantasy value. But this is not that same team. This team has figured out if we run the ball, and it's not even that consistent because the problem is Ronald Jones could give you, like he did one time, gave you 24 fantasy points one week. Next week gave you two. What the hark is that? What the hark is that? Yes, I know hark is a made-up word. I made it up. And what? You can't fight me. Just listen to me. And especially listen to the next part when we start talking about who's tagged and who's not. But yes, Tampa Bay figured out the best way to win a championship. You build that defense around Tom. You make sure you keep Antoine Whitfield. I mean, he's a rookie, so you, you of course, are keeping him. You keep Shaq Barrett because you need him. He won a Super Bowl for the Broncos, and now you want a Super Bowl for you. He's Shaq Barrett. He showed what he can do. Pay the man if you have the money. Levante David got that two-year extension for 25 years. That's another thing that's concerning. You know that he's only getting the two-year contract because he's like, eh, Tom Brady's going to play to like, what, 45 realistically? And then he's out? And when he's out, I'm out. We're not going to be championship ball no more. We're going to go back to the same old Tampa Bay, or just regular Tampa Bay Bucks. We're not Tampa Bay. Before the Bucs won the Super Bowl, they didn't make it to the playoffs since when? Oh, you guessed it right. 2003 when they played the Raiders and beat them in the Super Bowl. So when the Bucs go to the playoffs, they just win the Super Bowl, but it's few and far between. So they figured out the sauce. I don't think they're going to give Odell Beckham that much love. If he goes to the Bucs, do not draft him. I wouldn't even draft him higher than Devontae Smith or Jamar Chase. Just because I see that Oda Beckham is getting injury prone. He's very diva. And I don't mess with divas because divas are very unpredictable. One day they're happy with their situation. The next day they're not. But Tom Brady does have a history of buckling down divas like Antonio Brown. So that's, I guess, your one flyer. I expect 900 yards, six touchdowns. I guess 1,000 if Tom Brady's trying to push 1,000 to him. Because Oda Beckham's literally going to cry if he doesn't get it. So, But with all those threats... The formula they built, the culture they built, Odell Beckham, to me, is not even a top 25 fantasy receiver. When we come back, we are going to do tag, you're it. We're going to go back to the playground days when either you got tagged or, oh, I didn't get tagged all recess. We'll figure out who in the NFL got tagged and who didn't get tagged and Don't forget to tune in to more NFL news. And at the end of the show, my last segment, we're going to figure out, is it more believable that these people will give this fantasy production, specifically these NFL players, or is it more believable that Baker saw a UFO? We'll be back after the commercial. 
Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back. I am Ryan Basulto, and this is the worst Terminator impression ever. And we just came back from giving the biggest news in the NFL, which was Dak Prescott getting signed to his crazy deal. What does that mean for all the Cowboys and their fantasy implications? And what would the fantasy implications be if Odell Beckham were to join the Bucks? Also, at the end of the show, stick around because we are going to talk about for example, say I think Derek Carr is going to be a top 15 quarterback next year. What's more believable, that Derek Carr is going to be a top 15 fantasy football quarterback or that Baker Mayfield actually saw the UFO? That's a good segment, so stick around for that at the end. But now with a lot of fantasy implications on the line, we are going to see who got franchise tagged and who didn't. You ever remember when you were in elementary school and you were playing tag, and of course it was just tag, and that's just what it was, but there was always underlying feelings in it. Say a cute girl got in, you're like, ooh, I want her to tag me, because then it shows like, I don't know, that's how kids show feelings. They just show like, I guess, acts of aggressive aggressiveness, or they kind of just are weird. Or is that just boys? Because boys act weird around girls when they think they're cute at a young age, because they'll just start hitting them or saying, or being mean to them, and that's just their way of saying I like you. So, in tag... That's kind of a way you could see like, eh, maybe this girl has a thing for me. Maybe she has a little crush on me. Maybe we could share a sandwich later with some chips. No, I'm not sharing my chips. I'm too big. I'm not down. But that inspired me to create a little segment I like to call Tag You're It. Don't mind my little kid voice. It sounds actually like my normal voice. So I'm going to name a list of people. And not all at one time, but just I'm going to name a name, and then we're going to say if he was tag, you're it, or aw, you weren't tagged. So let's start off with Chris Godwin, wide receiver of the Tampa Bay Bucks. We were just talking about the Tampa Bay Bucks in the last segment. Chris Godwin's a top 10 receiver according to Pro Football Focus. He gave... eh, He gave decent numbers last year. He gave 900 yards. He did what he could do because he was hurt for most of the year. Um, and guess what? He was tagged. You're it. He was tagged. He was franchise tagged. The Bucks are going to have him for another year. So this adds on to my theory that there's not going to be enough ball to go around for all of the Tampa Bay Bucks. There's too many people, just way too many people. And it's not even close. So Chris Godwin got tagged. And I think that helps out their offense a lot because Chris Godwin would have easily been the top receiver in free agency if he wasn't franchise tag. So that was a good get by the, the Bucks. They win, pretty much are winning the offseason. They got Levante David back. They got Chris Godwin back. That's good. That's good. That's the way to start. Let's see how Tom rallies that team together. Fantasy value, Chris Godwin, baby, you're stuck in the same spot. You're going to get hurt. They don't need you for every game because they already have a bunch of talented receivers and tight ends and running backs, as I keep saying. So it's just... You want to be get fantasy pe- uh, personnel from championship teams, but that's the wrong championship team. You don't want a championship team that spreads the ball too much. You want a championship team that's going to feed 
the ball to one specific person, a.k.a. like a Derrick Henry, or even a Stephon Diggs on the Bills. Just someone who's going to get the ball majority of the time. And besides Mike Evans, I don't see that happening for anybody. <sighs> so, Chris Godwin, tag your it, but I don't think that it's a good look. For fantasy, at least. Allen Robinson. Allen Robinson hates the Bears. I mean, he hates them. He's tired of them wasting his talent. He just wants a long-term deal, and the Bears aren't giving it to him. So they're not going to franchise tag him, right? Wrong. Tag. You're it. You're tagged, Allen Robinson. You get the franchise tag, and I'm sure you aren't happy about it because I know. I know you really want to leave, and I know Chicago is definitely not the place for you. Um, He even went on the Chris Collinsworth show featuring uh, Richard Sherman, his podcast, on Pro Football Focus. Make sure to check that out. That's a good that's a good little podcast if you want some informative stuff that could help you with your fantasy teams. And Alan Robinson said, I think I could get a long-term deal done on 31 other teams. Mind you, there are only 32 teams in the NFL. So if he's saying that, he's pretty much saying the Bears are the only team that can't give him a deal and he doesn't understand why. He's a top seven fantasy receiver according to PPR. And yes, I know, 7 is a weird number, but that's because he was at 7. It just shows you how great he was. He only got single digits one time the whole year in fantasy football. No, twice. Two times the whole year in fantasy football. That is great, consistent numbers. He helped me win a fantasy championship, even on the Bears. He gave me 20 fantasy points because you also got to think he plays the Lions and the Vikings two times a year. And as long as they have decimated secondaries, oh, it's over. I mean, yes, he goes against J.R. Alexander twice a year, and one of them's always a a game where he gets usually locked down. The other one, he gets a decent amount of uh, fantasy points. But Allen Robinson is a premier fantasy receiver. Now, he's not too happy. He's not happy. So I would be a little cautionary on getting him. I wouldn't get say, Allen Robinson over a Mike Evans. I wouldn't get him over, who's another good receiver? Chase Claypool. I don't think I would get him over my uh, Chase Claypool. I was going to call him my boy. He's not my boy. He's weird. You see the little TikToks he does? He's too young, and he's getting that diva complex. But this is before the diva complex takes over, so I wouldn't even get him over him. Uh, who's another receiver? I wouldn't even get him over DJ Moore. I know DJ Moore was inconsistent last year. But I'm saying, Allen Robinson's not happy where he's at. Yes, they need to keep him because they got to like want to get Russell Wilson or Deshaun Watson and say, hey, at least we have Allen Robinson for you. But fantasy value-wise, he's outside of the top 10 for me, uh, top 15, just for the simple fact that I don't think he's going to like it there. And that's going to affect his play. And he gave you a great year last year. So, I mean, when you give a great year, unless you're the best receiver on ice – you're not going to really reciprocate it unless um, there are changes that are made. If Russell Wilson goes there, Deshaun Watson, Allen Robinson, top five, top ten receiver easy just because he's that good. But Mitchell Trubisky, Nick Foles, I don't know who their quarterback is. And Matt Nagy just isn't consistent as a play caller. So eh, I don't think that's just definitely the move for him. So fantasy value, have some you know caution on him. I still get CeeDee Lamb over Allen Robinson too. Uh, let's go over someone else. Oh, we're going to the lineman. Brandon Scherf, Washington football team. The 29-year-old all-pro guard was one of the constant staples on that Washington O-line. I was about to call them the Hogs, but they're not that team anymore. But the Washington football team did tag him. They tagged him. And the reason why I'm talking about this lineman, and I know you're thinking, why are we talking about linemen when it comes to a fantasy football podcast? You know who he's blocking for, right? He's blocking for whoever the quarterback is throwing to Logan Thomas and Terry McLaurin, which are very valuable fantasy um, pickups, and Antonio Gibson, a top 10 fantasy football running back. Last year, if you don't believe me that I know the sauce in fantasy football, last year I traded Mike Davis while he was popping off, because I knew Christian McCaffrey wasn't going to come back, I traded him for Antonio Gibson. Because that guy thought Antonio Gibson was washed, and he was only going to give a good performance against the Cowboys. Wrong. Antonio Gibson 
is basically Christian McCaffrey. And okay, 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 I know what you're thinking. Yeah, he's not as good as Christian McCaffrey, but he could get yards. He breaks tackles. He's one of the best running backs in the league at yards after the after first hit contact. The yak. One of the most useful things as a running back. After you get hit the first time, which is bound to happen as a running back, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to be that top five running back. That's what I'm going to be. Antonio Gibson. Gave you three touchdowns against the Cowboys on Thanksgiving. Just you saw what he could do last year. Oh, he was only getting better just because they were trying to put in Darius. Guys, that weirdo. We're not going to talk about him on the show ever. Um, uh, JD McKissick. All these people. And the Washington football team couldn't. They would fall down a lot of times on the scoreboard because their defense was barely figuring it out with Chase Young. And their defense is one of the top defenses. So when you're a top defense, you're going to want to run the ball. Antonio Gibson, I would get him top two rounds next year. Second round pick, easy, bar none. Last year, I got him in the fantasy drafts. and all my drafts, I got him. So I got him around round six. Oh, and if you also don't believe in my sauce, just know, I draft for some of my friends. Some of my friends legit give me teams and they're like, oh, just please draft for me, draft for me. I'll do everything else. I'm like, no, like, like, like you could draft. No, I drafted. I won two fantasy championships this year, two last year for my other friends. I just know what I'm doing. I know when a diamond is in the rough. And Antonio Gibson's a diamond in the rough. So Brandon Sheriff is going to lead him to one more, one more great fantasy year. One more. I don't know if he, he could keep doing it. But I'm just saying, at least next year is the year. I can't predict the next couple years but next year Antonio Gibson is going to be the man in Ron Rivera's offense because he's the one remember that started that whole let's dump off to Christian McCaffrey oh no let's just throw it to one receiver oh no let's just throw it to tight end let's keep it simple wide receiver to tight end to running back type of offense you're not really going all over the place not spreading it out too much you're just feeding the main people in the offense that need to be fed and that is the ultimate and when I say that I mean it ultimate fantasy offense you could have Logan Thomas Top four tight end in the NFL next year. In fantasy. <laughs> Sorry. In fantasy, top four tight end easy. Terry McLaurin. We'll talk about that another time. But yes, Brandon Sheriff being on that team, being an all-pro this year, being a, pro, a four-time pro bowler, big-time franchise tag for the Washington football team. I salute them. That was, a, that was a great move on their end. Justin Simmons, safety for Denver Broncos. Let's see, Justin Simmons, Pro Football Focus, ranked him the number one covering safety last year. And then this year, a top three Pro Football Focus overall safety. The free safety is awesome. He could cover. He's tall from Notre Dame. So he's played against great competition his whole career, going into his collegiate years. This is the second year in a row the Broncos have tag, you're it, have tagged him. They have tagged him. And yes. Does this mean that the Broncos' defense is scary? I know what you're thinking. Oh, shoot. This is a big pickup for the Broncos, right? Like, uh, I don't know what's going to happen for them. Are they are they going to start being an all-time defense like they were when they had Peyton Manning? No. No. Justin Simmons, I'm only talking about him because he's gotten tagged twice in a row, and that's the most you could do. If you tag him again, you have to give up two first-rounders to tag him. So it's really not realistic. You're going to give a third franchise tag. But this guy's an animal. So why the heck... Or do they keep franchise tagging him and not long-term signing him? He's one of the staples of that defense. And yet, the Broncos defense will still be... Yes, flatulent. Flat. Very gassy. Awful. Patrick Mahomes is going to rip him. So if you ever see anybody going against the Broncos defense next year in fantasy, as of now, don't be afraid to play him already because... And especially if you're looking for AFC West teams, look for AFC West teams. As soon as they meet the Broncos on the docket, it's time to ruin them. They're the worst team in the AFC West. Next name. Offensive guard, Joe Dunny from the New England Patriots. Now, the Patriots aren't that good. (laughs) Just in general. They're just not that good anymore. So, they're going to want to keep their one of their best guards, right? I know he was hurt all last year, but Pro Football Focus says he's an elite offensive guard. So he, he's played with Tom Brady, won Super Bowls. He has the championship mentality. He has the stature. He's huge. He has the accolades. But 
they nah you're not tagged and you're not it i don't know how i was gonna say they're not tagged but yeah he wasn't tagged joe dunny you would think that only throwing five touchdowns for cam newton all last year you would think that their running game that was horrendous behind damian harris and i guess sony michelle and james white that depleted three-headed monster you would think that they'd still want him but i guess not right but have no fear because they actually just got trent brown which we're going to talk about later when it comes to nfl news and they could just kind of put him wherever they want to so joe dunny is gone but just know I would never draft a New England Patriot. And that's what my point is. Do not draft a New England Patriot in fantasy football. They are voodoo. They do not throw the ball consistently. They do not run the ball consistently. They do not have one guy who runs. They do not have the main guy who catches because they have no catchers. Their best one's Julian Edelman, who's an old man who's hurt. And then they have Nikhil Harry, who's young and hurt. (laughs) Like, they're already thinking about trading him. So, no, they did not franchise tag Joe Dunny. Just like the Patriots did with Joe Dunny, stay away. Just stay away. Do not tag or touch any of the New England Patriots. No, they did not get tagged. Oh, finally a good name. Kenny Galladay, wide receiver of the Detroit Lions. So Kenny Galladay. This guy last year was an interesting conundrum because he played a couple of games. He played like four games, gave you all the fantasy numbers you wanted, for sure gave you all the fantasy numbers you wanted. Kenny Galladay was was that guy last year. Um, I mean the year before that. He has in 47 games at more receiving yards and more touchdowns than Calvin Johnson. Yes, Megatron, Hall of Famer, first ballot, Calvin Johnson. So Kenny Galladay is 6'5", out here doing better than Calvin Johnson on the Detroit Lions. They just got rid of Matt Stafford. Do they still want Kenny Galladay? Tag. You're not. I mean, you're not tagged and you're not it. Man, the guy made a mistake on the voice. Whatever. Um, Yes, Kenny Galladay was not franchise tagged. And the reason I think is because I think there was more to his injury last year than we're all led to believe. I follow at Fantasy Docs on Instagram. He's a great follow if you want to know who's hurt and who's not in fantasy football. He was the one that put up. Oh, Christian McCaffrey, I people say he's only out a week or two when he was kind of lingering from that injury. I think he's going to be out longer, so give more value to Mike Davis. That's what I did. I traded Duke Johnson for Mike Davis, got Mike Davis, flipped him for Antonio Gibson, and the rest is history. Uh, yes. So, where was I getting at? Yes, Kenny Galladay. Kenny Galladay. He, on Fantasy Docs, was saying that, okay, I know he has this lower leg injury, but we see him on the sidelines of practice. And this injury shouldn't be an injury that keeps you out too long. Why Why is he out so long? Why did he not play for the rest of the year after pretty much week five on? Well, I'll tell you why. He didn't want to be in Detroit. He doesn't believe in the Pistons or the Tigers or Rock City or Kiss. Kenny Galladay wants out. And that is why they didn't franchise tag him because he was just disgruntled the whole year. He just One of the top fantasy receivers you got in the first two rounds is not was not performing anything just because he was mad. And we don't like that diva complex, but he's so good. He's so good. And you know if he goes to um, a Dolphins or a Steelers or, you know, any other team that has an air raid offense, he's going to ball out. He's going to ball out. So Kenny Galladay, depending on where he goes, rumors are he might go to the Dolphins. If he goes to the Dolphins, right now. He's a second. He's a second round receiver to pick. He's a top ten receiver in fantasy. Easy. Kenny Galladay gives you the production. He just wasn't feeling the Lions. And can you blame him? Can does anybody really feel the Lions? I have interviewed people on the streets for um, just other projects and things that I have under my belt, and I've interviewed them and said, "Oh, what would you rather have, COVID or be a Lions fan?" And you should have seen how sad the guy's look was when he told me, hey, I'm a Lions fan. And But, like, he didn't defend the Lions. He just said, hey, that's 
That's me. That's my team. Hey, hey. So being a Lions fan isn't anything to brag about. I mean, they haven't won a playoff game since Barry Sanders won it for them in the 90s against the Dallas Cowboys, and that's their Super Bowl, basically. Poor Lions. Oh, all the great legends, Dick the Night Train Lane, Dick LeBeau, all these people who were from these teams, and Barry Sanders, and that's it. Oh, Matt Stafford, going to be a Lions legend. I mean, he's going to do his thing on the Rams, but Kenny Galladay, top 10 receiver, but just keep a look to see where he lands. If he doesn't land in the right spot, get him 15 through 20. Once again, I'd rather get an Adam Thielen. I'd rather get a C.D. Lamb. I'd rather get a Tyler Lockett. Uh, who else? What's that guy's name? Terry McLaurin. All these people, I would rather get than Kenny Galladay if he's not in the right situation or if he's staying on the Lions next year. If he's staying on the Lions, just stay away. Just completely stay away. But yes, they did not franchise tag Kenny Galladay. Linebacker Bud Dupree, Pittsburgh Steelers. Wow. Bud Dupree is a really good linebacker. And I think that he's an outside pass rushing guy. And they don't need him because of TJ Watt. But he can line up on any other team. And that is why the Steelers are like, eh, we'd rather try out our other people. We're going to tag other people. We're You're not it. You're, you're not tagged. So Bud Dupree doesn't get tagged. And this is very important because the Steelers defense was the number one fantasy football defense last year. They have Mika Fitzpatrick, TJ Watt rushing, who's, if it wasn't for Aaron Donald, the best defensive player in the league. But I've been knowing that since his rookie year, and he gave nine sacks. And I was like, J.J. Watt's brother's giving nine sacks his first year? Oh, yeah. This guy's going to the roof, his ceiling. I mean, his uh, stock. Yeah, stock's going through the roof. The Pittsburgh Steelers just feel like they have more linebackers to play with that are young than pay Bud Dupree the fat bucks like he deserves. So just go to another team. You could go to the Broncos. You could go to who else needs it? The Rams need a linebacker. You could go to the New England Patriots. You go anywhere else, but we're just not gonna tag you're you're not tagged. You're not it. You're not you're not it. We're not we're not getting you on the playground. You just stay in the corner and keep running in circles pretending someone's gonna tag you, but you're not gonna get tagged. And I was talking to a couple of my colleagues, and I believe that Bud Dupree was a bad person to get rid of. But he, my friend was making a good point. He said that the Steelers historically have great drafting, uh, great draft classes with linebackers. So they drafted James Harrison, they draft James Ferrier, they draft Ryan Shazier, T.J. Watt. They do not have a problem. Drafting linebackers. Lamar Woodley. They don't have a problem with it. So I think that they're just betting on themselves, which is smart. Build yourself through the draft. That is where championships are made. And I'm not even talking about always fantasy championships, but actual NFL championships are made in the draft. Those are where you make the moves for the linemen. You make it for the linebackers. The D-line. You make it for key pieces that are going to make your skill players from fantasy football next year either ball out, be on the field more, or just completely destroy another fantasy football player because they have a crazy D-line. So Bud Dupree, I could see why they did not franchise tag him. Steelers don't really need to to still have that top fantasy football defense. Mika Fitzpatrick, I mean, just brings them so many touchdowns and defensive scores that I feel like they're just going to be a top five defense again next year. It's just always going to work out that way. The Steelers know how to draft good defenses. It's been all the way since the Steel Curtain. So trust that Steelers defense if you're looking on a defense in fantasy. Next person, Hunter Henry, tight end of the San Diego Chargers. Scratch that. Los Angeles Chargers. Man, voice guy, stop messing up. It's the Los Angeles Chargers now. No one really cares or matters in LA besides the Rams, so I don't know why the Chargers would come here. But Hunter Henry, a great fantasy tight end. Finally was healthy last year. Showed you what he could kind of do. Problem is he always gets hurt. Injury prone. And you, like I said, you don't always want to base people off their injuries in the upcoming fantasy year. Because there's people like Dalvin Cook who was hurt the year before that. Balled out this year. Adam Kamara got hurt last year. Balled out this year. It's not always the case. But Hunter Henry is just one of those cases that I just don't see him ever always staying healthy. He's just an injury prone guy. So I see how the Chargers just did. 
not tag him. Tag, you're not it. Wait, why would you tag someone if they're not it? Whatever. But he didn't get franchise tagged. New England is probably a good destination for him. If he goes there, I could see some value in it just because they like that Gronk type of tight end. Um, and it's just hard to find that type, like to find a smart tight end that will jump all over uh, jump all over the field and is athletic in the red zone like Hunter Henry. If Hunter Henry goes to a team like the Bengals, that would be a good team too. Joe Burrow needs a security blanket. All they have is what, Drew Sample? Yeah, no, that's that's not enough. So Hunter Henry, decent fantasy value. I've never been a big fan on him, though, just because he gets too hurt. I'd rather get Logan Thomas. I'd rather do the flyer on the rookie Kyle Pitts, who's going to be coming out of the draft. You could see where he ends up. I'd rather get Noah Font even than Hunter Henry. So Hunter Henry, yeah, a lot of people have their hype. Yes, he gave you a good year last year. Temper it down. Patriots are a good fit for him. I just don't see it happening. So let's get on to another player. Juju Smith-Schuster. We're back to the Steelers again. Wide receiver of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Is set to become a free agent. The Corvette Corvette guy who just decimated the Steelers' morale because he just couldn't stay off of the field and dancing and TikTok. And who can let this kid on the field? This is basically what the Steelers are yelling. So they did not tag him. They definitely left him in the corner. A team I could see him going to is the Raiders. The Raiders are a good fit. A.B. didn't work out, but perhaps a second shot at a former Steelers receiver will, you know, will, will will help him. And no QB likes a target with a short area of the field more than Derek Carr, and that's Juju's specialty. He works like with the short side of the field, so Juju knows how to work his side. They would have Henry Ruggs on the other side, spread him out, If Juju was on the Raiders, I still wouldn't draft him over Kenny Galladay, even if the Lions were to somehow create an agreement with them. Or if Allen Robinson. And here's why. Juju Smith is not a receiver one. Antonio Brown really did make that guy open most of the time. Like, let's just call it how we see. Antonio Brown is one of the best receivers of this decade. Gave you multiple years of 100-yard, 1,500, 100-catch seasons. You don't just do that any day. You just don't get open like that after they double bracket you all the time any day. Juju Smith-Schuster was getting a lot of single coverage. No love was for him because he was a rookie coming out of UFC. He's good, but not great. I just wouldn't draft him. I wouldn't draft him just for the simple fact that there's a lot of better receivers. I'd rather get Will Fuller than Juju Smith-Schuster because Will Fuller puts up bombs and numbers. At least if he gets hurt, he's out. But when he comes, he just drops 20. I'd rather get DJ Moore, too. I'd rather get Robbie Anderson. All these people I'd rather get than him. Chase Claypool. Chase Claypool, his counterpart. I'd rather much get Chase Claypool over him. But yes, you did not get tagged for a reason, Juju. And I think there's a big reason to it because Corvette, Corvette. And that's all I got to say. Last name. Aaron Jones, running back of the Green Bay Packers was the running back of the Green Bay Packers because they didn't tag him either. Tag, you're not it. How do you even do that? How do you tag someone if they're not it? You just air tag them? Tag, you're not it. So you're just pointing at them? Just might as well get everyone in the schoolyard laughing at Aaron Jones. But yes, they're all laughing at Aaron Jones because they said, oh, you want a lot of money? How about we have A.J. Dillon, who's bigger than you, more of a three down back, and did I mention bigger than you? (laughs) And, oh, wait, you could catch? Oh, yeah, so can Jamal Williams. So why would we need you? What What's the purpose of you? We could just make you another one of you, which I think they can. Aaron Jones is a great running back, don't get me wrong, but he's not Superman. He's not an every down back because he's small. Yes, he could catch. Yes, he could still run the ball and get you crazy games. But he's not doing that every game. Did he do it against the Bucks? No. In the playoffs? No. So I think it's just Matt LaFleur's running scheme. Don't forget, Matt LaFleur was the head coach of Derrick Henry and the Titans before Mike Vrabel. So Matt LaFleur knows how to run the ball in a ground-and-pound type of style. So he has good run schemes. He's also a good friend of Sean McVay, 
who's another great coach. And if you just and Kyle Shanahan, if you guys all just hang out together, great minds think alike. You guys were all part of the same coaching staff. You know what it means to run the ball. He was also an assistant coach on the Washington football team. He knows what it means to run the ball. They don't need Aaron Jones, A.J. Dillon, Jamal Williams. Handcuff Jamal Williams to A.J. Dillon if you draft him next year. A.J. Dillon should rush for 1,000 yards, should give you at least six, seven touchdowns. I wouldn't get him in the first four rounds if it's like a, say, a 10-man draft. But fifth round, I'm taking the flyer. That's when you get like James White, Mark Ingram, not any more of those guys, but that's when they were in their prime and heyday, you would get them around there. And that's the value I see him at. So Aaron Jones, his value just depends on where he goes to. <laughs> People who also want him, the Dolphins. Dolphins also want him. Uh, he would work with them just because at age 26, he'll this will be the best contract he could get because he's not likely to get another one. And I think that he'll have little competition. He only has Miles Gaskin and Aaron Jones. And they could see it like they could pretty much rerun what the Packers were doing. So they'll say, oh, Miles Gaskin, you'll be our Jamal Williams guy because you could catch more. You could still run, but you, you catch more. And Aaron Jones, you'll be more of our runner. And if we need you on third down, I guess a third down back. But Miles Gaskin got hurt a lot last year too, so they kind of just need someone because at one point last year they were just left with Philip Layard and DeAndre Washington off the <laughs> off the practice squad. Matt Burrito was hurt. Miles Gaskin was hurt. They had nobody. So Aaron Jones would be a good fit for the Dolphins. If he went to the Dolphins, get him in the third round. If you really, really believe in Aaron Jones, like I don't, <laughs> Second round. Second, second round. Because he's inconsistent. I feel like he could just get better running backs than that. Um, I, I, I'd rather get Najee Harris or even Javante Williams, the rookies coming out, more than Aaron Jones on a Dolphins team. He's good, but he's – once again, he'll give you that 40 game, that 40-point game, fantasy points. But then the next week he's going to give you, what, 11, 12? Then next week he'll give you 11 again? Nah. We – over here – with the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast with Ryan Basulto as host. We win championships here. We don't deal with second best. I don't care if you came in second place. You're first place loser. And that was just me being a little mean. I'm sorry. But, yes, that was our segment. Tag. You're it. Named off a bunch of NFL players. Told you if they were tagged. Told you if they were not hit with the franchise tag. Just know if you get the franchise tag, you can only get it another time. If you want to get it another time after that, it's probably not likely because you have to give up two first rounders. When we come back, we're still going to talk about a lot of great things, NFL news, my last segment. Just stick around after the commercial and you will hear the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. We are back with the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Thank you for listening. I love being your fantasy football podcast host. To be honest with you, nothing makes me happier in this world than fantasy football. 
So I'm glad I get to share it with you. Right now, we are going to go over some more NFL news. We're actually getting some breaking news right now. The Kansas City Chiefs are releasing both of their tackles. Both offensive tackles, right and left offensive tackle. So they're releasing Eric Fisher, the left tackle, number one overall, by the way, in the draft, and all-pro right tackle Mitchell Schwartz. Granted, they weren't there for the Super Bowl, and then we saw, but I mean, we saw what happened to Patrick Mahomes when they weren't there. Only scored nine points the whole Super Bowl. Historical low for Patrick Mahomes. Never threw a touchdown first time in Patrick Mahomes' whole career. He ran for 497 yards, just evading the pass rush. Poor Patrick Mahomes, man. He's out there just trying to do everything he can. And now they just got rid of his two tackles. Um, General Manager Brett Veach of the Chiefs just said, I have a tremendous amount of respect for both Eric and Mitchell. With Eric, obviously, he was one of the very first players we drafted when we got to Kansas City. And when we were able to watch him go for a solid tackle for many years, Mitchell... His durability and toughness is remarkable and has certainly left a mark on our team. They are big anchors for that Kansas City offensive line that has helped Patrick Mahomes win a Super Bowl, and now they are gone. The move comes as Kansas City transitions to the future without the veteran offensive line while dealing with the ever-concerning salary cap crunch. There's going to be a, a dip in the salary cap this year. And I know how are they supposed to pay all these people if Patrick Mahomes is making $450 million and Travis Kelsey's making all his money and then Tyreek Hill's making all his money. Poor guys, man. Those two guys were a big anchor to the team. But what I can't stress enough is that Patrick Mahomes besides against the Kansas City Chiefs who found out the sauce against him in that game I blame Eric Bieniemy. he wasn't doing a lot of quick passes he wasn't making it easier to get the ball out of Patrick Mahomes hands he wasn't running the ball more so it was hard for them to get anything going just in general now I think they're going to learn from their mistakes in the Super Bowl and be better than it because Patrick Mahomes like I said is like LaMelo Ball he's better in my opinion but they're the same type of player where they both adapt to the game. They're not just going to play one specific type of play style or say like uh, like Drew Brees. He's going to throw all game and that's his play style. Tom Brady, I'm going to throw the small passes. That's my play style. And, you know, dink and dunk on you all game. But Patrick Mahomes is, oh, I'm going to throw deep this game if I have to if we're down. Oh, we're down and my receivers aren't getting open. I'm going to run the ball. Oh, uh, we have to... You're guarding everything deep? Okay, then I'll just throw little dump passes to Travis Kelsey and Clyde Edwards. So I think the Kansas City offense is completely fine without those two left tackles, uh, left tackle and right tackles, but it's just like, whoa, now they're on the waiver wire. Waiver wire, speaking as if fantasy football is real life. Now they're in free agency, and they have the opportunity to join some really good teams. So I think that this is a big move for the Kansas City Chiefs because it's going to make or break them. A lot of times you hear about Super Bowl losers and you never hear good things because whoever loses the Super Bowl is probably going to suck the next year. We saw what happened with the Chiefs last year. We saw what happened with the Falcons uh, before that. We saw what happened with the Rams last year before that. All teams that lose in the Super Bowl the next year don't do historically great, but Patrick Mahomes is a historical man and he breaks records. You think defense wins championships until Patrick Mahomes comes around. This year was the case for defense, but he still beat the Niners' number one defense. Do not be scared for anybody on the Chiefs' offense because they're still going to do what they did last year. Honestly, if it's me, I'm drafting Tyreek Hill first pick. If I could get Patrick Mahomes with the second pick, or Tra- Travis Kelsey better. But if I get Patrick Mahomes, I'll get Patrick Mahomes. Pro- maybe stay away from Clyde edwards Hilaire, even though I think he's going to have a big leap this year. I'm telling you. Top 15 running back for sure. Better than what uh, Chris Carson or Aaron Jones will do for you. So I think their offense is completely fine. Don't be worried. I just wanted to go over it because it is breaking news. And they are all pro tackles. And when do you ever hear a team ever get rid of two tackles on the offensive side? It's it's crazy. That's when you know they just have a whole scheme and plan just in store for themselves. So, yeah. That was ridiculous. But did you hear what... Burger King said the other day for International Women's Month. Well, that day was International Women's Day, but it's the whole month. We appreciate our women all year round, so we're giving them a whole month. But Burger King said some weird stuff. They said 
women belong in the kitchen. And they were still had the rest of their thread where I was like, well, we need more women in the kitchen because only 20% of our chefs are women. But no, no, no. Let's, let's go back to what you said. You said women belong in the kitchen. No. What type of prehistoric dinosaur old man that probably said this? thought that was okay of course burger king would be the prehistoric place to say it but it's like come on now why are you saying women belong in the kitchen? you're saying some such crazy things that belong in the past that stuff is not we're changing the narrative now we know more we're smarter there's more technology to give us a bunch of more information we are not gonna fall into that ignorant way of thinking anymore you know who else was saying some ignorant things that belong in the past jason peters tackle of the Eagles, he said that Carson Wentz reuniting with the Colts, Carson Wentz is going to get back to his MVP caliber of play, Jason Peters, man. I know what you said isn't as, definitely not nearly as bad as what Burger King said, but that belongs in the past, man. Leave that mess in the past. Carson Wentz is damaged goods. He's done, dude. Yes, they're going to give him a good tackle, but I told you, his fantasy value is not going to be that great. MVP caliber play means that he is going to come out and be a top three quarterback. If we're talking about fantasy and you're an MVP caliber quarterback, let's think of all the MVP caliber quarterbacks before him. Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Peyton Manning. Like, do you, is he that? Is he going to be that good in fantasy? No. Do not listen to Jason Peters. He is Burger Kinging you right now. He is saying some crazy things that just belong in the past. Carson Wentz, look. It's hard for Carson Wentz to just live on his day-to-day life as an Eagle when he was an Eagle for the simple fact that they had a trophy of Nick Foles and Doug Peterson outside of the stadium. So every single time he co- you go to work, you see a trophy of another guy who did what you were supposed to do but way better. And you're never going to let live that down. And I just think it's always going to be in the back of his mind. Because, yeah, he's on a new team. Yes, that team's defense is great. Yes, they have good offensive weapons. Great running backs. Pretty good receivers. Awesome offensive line. Awesome. Top two offensive line in the NFL. And I can see why Jason Peters thinks that. I can see why Jason Peters thinks that. Because only 20% of the people in the NFL are actually good chefs or whatever the heck Burger King's argument was. They are terrible. They're terrible. Why would you think that's okay to tweet? I hope that guy got fired. Just like, I don't want Jason Peter to get fired, but come on, man. You can't be saying these crazy things that are supposed to be left in the past. I understand coach, uh, head coach Frank Reich is supposed to be the quarterback guru. Oh, I'm, I'm the all-knowing guru, and I'm going to lead you like Philip across the rivers. And no, no. Carson of Wentz, you have, you're just not going to be a top 15 fantasy quarterback. I'm just letting him fall out of the draft. I don't care what Jason Peters says. It belongs in the past. He's not as bad as Burger King, but he's saying some crazy things. So I just thought that was a little correlation right there. From a former Eagles quarterback to a current Eagles quarterback, the Eagles have reportedly planned to build around quarterback Jalen Hurts rather than bring in a quarterback for the competition job via Chris Mortensen. Chris Mortensen, always one of the main people next to Shefty and Rappaport on NFL News, so you know it's reliable. But Jalen Hurts, he was a great fantasy quarterback last year for the simple fact that his legs opened up a lot of the game for him. His legs are what make him valuable. The Lamar Jackson effect, the Deshaun Watson effect, the Russell Wilson effect. He's going to get rushing yards. He's going to get rushing touchdowns. They, he has Miles Sanders, who is a good running back to me, fantasy value-wise. But it's just, I don't think he's going to be that consistent and always be there. But the thing is, if Miles Sanders is there and he's not hurt, which he should not be hurt majority of the season, I think 10 games would be, at least Miles Sanders would be in the game, uh, 10 out of the 16 games. But Jalen Hurts is going to be a top 10 fantasy quarterback. And let me tell you why. When Lamar Jackson started coming out with this crazy little offense and we saw a good fantasy value, the next year what happened? Balled out. Same thing with Deshaun Watson. Same thing with Russell Wilson. 
these quarterbacks are just going to open these coaches are just going to open up the playbook for Jalen Hurts. They're going to open it up so that he can run the ball, do all his plays, and no defensive coordinator is really ready to see the offense, especially since they got new head coach on the Eagles, not Doug Peterson anymore. So it's going to be a whole new scheme. They're going to run it with them. They're going to figure out how to use him as a gadget player, like kind of like Taysom Hill. I just see a lot of great potential out of it because no defensive coordinator is ready for it yet. And if you have no film on it, at least this year he should ball out. I see 3,500 passing yards. He did good in Oklahoma. He did good in Alabama, won a national championship. He's seen the big stages. He did good against the Saints when he beat the Saints earlier in the year. I'm talking about this year. Jalen Hurts has more potential to have MVP fantasy caliber than Carson Wentz. So I, if I'm drafting anybody between the two, I'm drafting Jalen Hurts way before I draft Carson Wentz. Like, come on now, dude. Carson Wentz, really? Like, I just, I just think he's washed goods. And I don't think that that's whatever is in the back of his mind is not out of it fully. A lot of quarterback talk. Apparently, the Patriots want Jimmy G as their top priority. Jimmy G's played his four season with the 49ers, his best season. 3,900 yards, 27 touchdowns, 13 picks. Does that sound sexy and attractive to you? I don't think so. The Eastern Illinois product, his three seasons with the Patriots, his best season is when Tom Brady got hurt. He threw for 502 yards, four touchdowns, 113.3 QBR. He's a run and manage quarterback. Um, he has no weapons in, fat in a New England, man, if he were to go. He has Nikhil Harry, James White, Sony Michelle, Damian Harris, Julian Edelman. If Jimmy G reunites with the Patriots and you're telling me his best year, even with decent weapons, was 27 touchdowns and 13 picks... Keep me away from that whole team just in general still. I still don't want to touch the Patriots with a 10-foot pole. Because Jimmy G is having good years, yes. But you got to think he has Kittle. George Kittle, the ultimate security blanket. Oh, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I can't throw deep. Uh, I, I, I tried to throw deep to Emmanuel Sanders in the Super Bowl, and it overshot him. And I just can't forget the scarring memory of my knees just tearing every damn game. Yeah. No. I don't think so. Jimmy G is scared. He doesn't throw that deep. He's a game manager. He's a worse game manager than Alex Smith, in my opinion, but he wins more for some reason. I guess he just brings has a winning culture like the Patriots, so they'll win, but fantasy value-wise, and that's what the show's all about, I stay away from anyone on the Patriots, even if Jimmy G gets there. Now, if they were to get rid of Jimmy G and get another quarterback, which I think the Niners really want to do, they're just kind of waiting around the draft. Maybe they'll draft one. Maybe they won't. We'll see on April's fantasy football shows. But someone that they've been wanting is quarterback of the Jets, Sam Darnold. He's great on the Jets. <laughs> but the Jets are the worst franchise ever. They are terrible. They went to two AFC championships, blew up that team, and never been never been back. Before that, haven't been to the Super Bowl since Joe Namath called the game. Yes, if you have to look at that film, you have to go to NFL Films in the archives. Let's go through all the old film. That's what you have to do to see a great Jets season. The Niners are a great franchise, though, with a great organization. Sam Darnold's stuck with what? Chris Herndon? Jameson Crowder? Brishrod Perryman? A shell of Le'Veon Bell for half a season and then you get I don't even know. You have Frank Gore, the old man who doesn't age. I don't I don't dig it. But if he goes to the Niners, great franchise. You have three better running backs than your current running back on the Jets right now. Even if Tevin Coleman doesn't stay healthy or Raheem Moster, you have a bunch of them. You have Jeff Wilson Jr. Um, you still have Kittle, Debo, and Ayuk, who are three options way better than any of the options on the New York Jets. Also, Sam Darnold gets mobile. He rushed, I've seen him rush against a 50-yard touchdown rush on the Broncos. Just take it straight up the gut on them. Like he said, oh, I'm gone, mobile. And he's a tough guy. So you know in that grounded pound scheme, that West Coast team that Kyle Shanahan is bringing to the San Francisco Niners, he could finally have a tough, mobile, raw quarterback that he could, get. he has a lot of potential. Sam Darnold on the Jets, I mean on the Niners, would definitely, definitely be a top 10 quarterback. I would just keep my eye on him. I still wouldn't draft him. But I would definitely be looking and like, hey, like I, I see you, Sam Darnold. I know what you're capable of. And the Niners have great coaching, great organization, great weapons. 
They just get hurt, and their quarterback never stays healthy. So, don't forget, their defense ha- didn't have the Bosa brother, and now he's coming back. Sam Darnold on the Niners is a match made in heaven for everyone on the Niners. Debo Samuel automatically becomes a fifth. No, uh, Brandon Ayuk automatically becomes a third round receiver. Debo Samuel automatically becomes a fifth, sixth round receiver in fantasy football drafts. George Kittle automatically is a second, still second rounder if you believe in him. I don't just because he gets hurt too much. I'd rather get, like I said, Darren Waller, Noah Font. Kyle Pitts, preferably Logan Thomas, because I just love how Ron Rivera runs that offense. So I Sam Darnold on there, yes. Jimmy G on the Pat- Patriots, no. Jimmy G on the Niners, don't like it. Brandon Ayuk's the only one I would like on the Niners if Jimmy G's around. And yeah, a lot of quarterback news. A lot, a lot of quarterback news. Uh, Drew Locke apparently isn't looking too good in training cap. Vic Fangio says he's going to bring in some quarterback competition. He says that until Drew proves... To be the next great quarterback like the ones Denver has been used to in the years past or once certain teams around the league have, we're going to always try to bring in competition but I have confidence Drew can continue to improve. Scratch that, but I have confidence for Drew to improve nonsense that he said at the end. He only said that to like put a little bow on the trash talking to us. He basically set up a garbage can put all the trash of Drew Locke in there and said, oh, it's all trash. Then just put a little bow. But no, no, no. I have a little bit of confidence in him. That's full of malarkey. I, so now you know, I am a Denver Broncos fan. I'm not a biased Denver Broncos fan. I am a realistic Denver Broncos fan. They stink. They stonk, stark. Just a lot. They, they smell on, they smell on everything. (laughs) They're the worst smelling thing in the NFL, in my opinion, next to the Detroit Lions. They have no future. Vic Fangio doesn't know what he's doing at all on the offensive end. He's supposed to be a defensive guy. Their defense is barely good. I just don't see anything happening with Drew Locke. And Drew Locke has Tim Patrick, a good fantasy receiver. I would say top seven round. So put him, get him in like the seventh round. Uh, he has Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler, great receivers, Noah Font, Melvin Gordon, the undrafted Philip Lindsay, who's not that great, but still good runner. Like, come on. You have everything you need. It's Drew Locke. Time to bring in the quarterback competition. You need someone to bring it out the best out of him. And you know who's going to bring the best out of him? And who's also been rumored, if he doesn't retire, to go to the Broncos? Ryan Fitzpatrick. Oh, if it's Patrick. Ooh, uh. Yes, Ryan Fitzpatrick. Oh, it's Fitzmagic. This guy. Everywhere he goes to almost just turns into gold. Um, Brian Fitzpatrick on the Broncos would make every weapon better. They would be a 9-7 and seven team. He knows how to manage enough. I've seen him play games where he has to really duke it out, and he's going against tough defense, and he still pulls out victories. I mean, must we not forget when he was down with 20 seconds to go against the Raiders on his own 20-yard line, and he had to score a field goal with no timeouts to go? And the Raiders literally pulled the guy's face mask. He threw a no-look 50-yard bomb, put them in position to win another game. They just had to pull him out the next week because of Tua. Ryan Fitzpatrick wins games. The Harvard graduate knows what it takes. He has the confidence of what it takes. He didn't have the great receivers on the Dolphins like he does, like he would if he were to go to the Broncos. Like I said, three great receivers, Jerry Judy, Tim Patrick, and the upcoming KJ Hamler, along with Noah Font. Let's not forget Noah Font's fantasy value that will rise if Ryan Fitzpatrick comes. Because Ryan Fitzpatrick to Mike Gusecki in a 14-game span. 54 catches, 698, 7 touchdowns. That's not from a George Kittle or a Darren Waller. He's getting way more touchdowns than a Darren Waller and a, a Kittle this year just because Kittle's always hurt. Only person I wouldn't put him above is really just... What's what's that guy's face? Travis Kelsey, the man, the myth, the legend, the unicorn, or Patrick Mahomes said the giraffe because he's big and in the field and stuff. <laughs> but yes, Ryan Fitzpatrick would be tight end gold for Noah Font. Noah Font or Mike Gesicki was averaging 15.6 yards per catch second among tight ends with 10 catches. Noah Font will be gold. His fantasy value will shoot up if Ryan Fitzpatrick is here. If Ryan Fitzpatrick is also on the Broncos, I would just wait for him to fall into the the waiver wire and just wait 
and then just take a flyer on him and just put him on your bench. Have him there. That's what I did last year. I had uh, I was rum, rummaging through quarterbacks, but I at one point I I would always keep Ryan Tannehill because I'm like, eh, he's pretty good. And then I had what Drew Lock. Drew Lock stunk. So then I just picked up Justin Herbert. I would just have these two fantasy waiver wire pickups. Yes, Ryan Tannehill and Justin Herbert in a competitive twelve man fantasy league. I had both of those guys because I waited. Ryan Fitzpatrick has the value of a Ryan Tannehill, and I'm not that just saying that because he's Ryan Tannehill. That's Ryan Fitzpatrick, and I'm Ryan Basulto, and we all have the best name of all time. But I am saying it because he knows how to distribute the ball, he'll air out the ball, and he'll definitely go long. He'll give the deep balls that give a lot of fantasy points. He'll look at Noah Font because he'll look, one, two, three, you're not open. Oh, I'm a normal quarterback. I'm just going to throw it instead of panic and hold the ball and get sacked. So Noah Font value up, Ryan Fitzpatrick, keep an eye on him, and receivers Value will go up. I don't know how good. I'm going to have to come up with a list because as a Bronco fan, and just know this, as a loving Bronco fan, I don't draft any Broncos because <laughs> I know that we stink and there's no reason to draft a Bronco. If you would have got Tim Patrick off the waiver wire, good for you. But you drafted Malvin Gordy. You drafted Jerry Judy. You saw how they stunk for you. Noah Font, he was inconsistent this year because of Drew Locke's quarterback play. Um, quarterback play is a big thing. We still got to worry about Alex Smith. Alex Smith got cut. By the Washington football team. Poor guy, man. He has no leg and then he got cut. Uh, But apparently he might make a reunion with Urban Meyer. Because it's almost a no-brainer. The new Jags coach, Urban Meyer, was Alex Smith's coach in Utah from 2003 to 2004. Yeah. He was the quarterback for Urban Meyer. So that's just a big thing. But they're going to draft Trevor Lawrence, which is obvious with that first pick. So if you have Trevor Lawrence, I would handcuff Alex Smith. They also did, I didn't talk about in the last one because there were so many franchise tags, Cam Robinson, their offensive tackle. That helps protect Trevor Lawrence and or Alex Smith, whoever comes in starting or if someone gets hurt, the other person replaces them. And that just raises all the value in the world to me, to whoever their tight end is and whoever their running back is which is James Robinson. James Robinson value goes up because Trevor Lawrence is another mobile quarterback. So you have to worry about his legs. You got to have a QB spy in the pocket at all point at all times. So then what's going to happen? You're going to look at him. What's going to happen? James Robinson's dragging over the middle, passing him. Boop. QB was worried about you the whole time. He didn't even, I mean, the linebacker was worried about you the whole time. He didn't even worry about the running back who's crossing the field right now. James Robinson. Fantasy value goes up crazy with Trevor Lawrence. And even Alex Smith, that's my point. If Alex Smith comes in, he only likes to throw to running backs. And James Robinson's their only running back that's good. The undrafted rookie of last year who was a top five fantasy running back, which I picked up off the waiver wire. Yes, I picked him up off the waiver wire. And yes, I traded him for Stephon Diggs. I'm telling you, I make moves all year when I want my fantasy championship. I know what I'm doing. James Robinson, fantasy value goes up with all these people. Supposed to go to that team because Alex Smith cannot throw a ball deeper than six yards down the field. And it's freaking hilarious to me. It's so hilarious. I just don't get it. (sighs) But yeah, that was just some more NFL news with the fantasy implications that follows it. That was a lot of good NFL news too because I'm telling you, there's just going to be so many moving parts throughout the rest of this offseason. I'm going to be here with you through it all. When we come back, we're going to come back to my favorite segment, my favorite part. We are going to do, is it more believable than Baker Mayfield seeing a UFO? If you want to hear this, I'm also going to make a video and put it up on Twitter on the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. So check this out. Just just check it out and stay after the show. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. 
We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSNC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSNC in the search bar. And welcome back to the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. We just got back from talking about the Chiefs releasing both of their offensive tackles. Who does that anymore? We were talking about Jason Peters. And why does he have so much faith in Carson Wentz? I think he's just saying a bunch of stuff that should be left in the past. And Jalen Hurts, is he the quarterback of the future? Is Drew Locke the quarterback of the future? Jalen Hurts, yeah. Drew Locke, not so much. But I just don't think the Broncos are that good to begin with. So now we're here back on my favorite part of the show, my segment I would like to call, Is It More Believable Than Baker Seen a UFO? Just last week on March 3rd, Baker put out a tweet and said, Almost 100% M, M, speaking about his wife, and I just saw a UFO drop straight out of the sky on our way home from dinner. We stopped and looked at each other and asked... Is this a progressive commercial? No, I'm kidding. If either of us saw it, very bright ball of light going straight down out of the sky towards Lake Travis, did anybody else witness it? I don't know, Baker. Apparently, you and your wife like to make a lot of commercials, so we don't know if you're just doing it for clout. Maybe you're just trying to get a sci-fi following. I don't know what you're in store for, Baker, but hey, it's not the craziest thing in the world. Just for the simple fact that people have been saying this for years. Uh, cavemen have been writing objects, unidentified objects that they see from the sky on walls in caves. So there's a lot of history to it. One of my favorite um, stories that's not so much of a story if you kind of, I guess, look at it in a different way, is the Sumerians, the people of Mesopotamia, which is the land of two rivers, which is between the Nile River and I forgot the other river. I think it's Euphrates. But that's where it's, it's where current day Iraq is. And the Sumerians wrote on these clay tablets in 4500 BC that were recovered in 1849. So just recently recovered a couple hundred years ago. And on the clay tablets, it said, oh, there's this group called the Anunnaki who came down and made humans. And the Sumerians were taken serious just for the simple fact that they were more scientifically advanced and mathematically advanced than any other society I mean, out of anybody, just in general, that was before when the world was starting. It's when there was just animals roaming the earth. So why are we given all this knowledge and how did we evolve faster than all these other animals if they've been here farther? Their whole point was aliens. The Anunnaki, they come every 3,700 years. Aliens come down and fed us all this knowledge from a different planet that just orbits the earth. So there's a lot of crazy stories, a lot of fun ones. We're going to break it down, though. If it's more believable that this certain fantasy football player is going to have a top five, top ten year, according to PPR, points per reception, one point per reception, or if it's more believable that Baker probably saw that UFO. So let's start off. We are going to start off with wide receiver A.J. Brown from the Tennessee Titans. Last year he had 70 catches. 1,075 yards and 11 tubs. He had seven games with plus 20 points. Only three games with single digits. Four games he was off because he was hurt. No, three games he was off because he was hurt. Will he be a top five fantasy receiver next year? Or is it more believable that Baker probably saw that UFO? I think it's more believable he'll be a top five fantasy receiver next year. And let me tell you why. Derrick Henry is always going to cause... A dramatic amount of tension. Especially up co- coming from this last year. Where Derrick Henry had 
over 2,000 yards, only one of eight running backs to ever do so, they're going to stack the box more than usual because they know, okay, well, they're, they've they been using Derrick Henry for like two years a lot. And then last year came and they're like, okay, they won't do it again, right? Maybe they'll lessen his load. No, wrong. <laughs> they're going to keep giving him the heavy workload. So what's that going to leave open? A.J. Brown. A.J. Brown is nothing to mess with. I think... He is the he is better than DK Metcalf out of that draft class. That's for sure. AJ Brown is a stud. He's as big as DK Metcalf. I mean, they were Ole Miss counterparts back in college. Top five receivers, not that difficult to to see because I only see what Tyree Kill, Devontae Adams, and another maybe another boy that I have later on. Just being in the top five, not many people you could see AJ Brown is really good and he missed three games with a thousand yards and still 11 touchdowns he get breaks he has like two or three 80 yard touchdowns this year 70 yard touchdowns he know he has what it takes so i think that next year it is more believable he will be a top five receiver in fantasy next person josh jacobs oakland raiders running back he was ranked number 11 last year according to ppr ESPN Standard Leagues, 273 rushes for 1,065 yards, so not as much as A.J. Brown, 10 yards less, and one more touchdown with 12 touchdowns. Will Josh Jacobs be a top 10 fantasy running back next year, or is it more believable that Baker saw the UFO? Now, there's these things called extremophiles, and they're microorganisms that live in extreme temperatures. How do you believe, how do microorganisms live in like near volcanoes or under the ocean where there's a lot of pressure and no actual human could live down there? So there's things called extremophiles. And the whole point on why people don't believe that aliens could are out there for the most part is not only because we haven't seen them, but just because you, you've been to other, we've studied other planets and their weathers are extreme. Either it's really, really cold and no one could live there. It's in- or it's impossible because it's just too hot over there. So extremophiles have made it, at least they're uh, somewhat of a belief that existing life can work out on another planet. Just because it's too hot or too cold for us humans doesn't mean... There's nothing else out there. So extremophiles kind of prove that UFOs exist. So I believe that UFOs, um, that Baker saw that UFO rather is more believable than Josh Jacobs being a top 10 fantasy running back. The reason why is because John Gruden's play calling. Like he plays to the game. So it's never fantasy favorable. You're never going to get an excessive use of Darren Waller. You're never going to get... Darren Waller's always open. That's why he gets great points. But you're never going to get excessive use of him. You're never going to get an excessive use of Josh Jacobs. There's games where he, he had a couple games where he only had single digits, like four games. You can't have that from a second round fantasy football uh, player. You just can't. And he just got a DUI the other day. So his DUI, following the January 4th arrest related to a single vehicle collision in Las Vegas. It's not over and the NFL could still put some punishment on him that goes into the beginning of next year. So what if he gets suspended a couple games and you don't have him just because he acted like a knucklehead and decided to drink and drive? And my final point is the Raiders are the Raiders. Raider Nation. You know them. They they lose. They lose a lot. And I don't expect the Raiders to not do dumb things, asinine things, just because they're the Raiders. And that's just simply how it goes. So Josh Jacobs, it's not that believable he'll be a top 10 running back next year. Let's go to the next name. T. Higgins. Nice. Okay, so T. Higgins, he's a baller. 67 catches, 908 yards, 6 touchdowns. Last year, this was with Joe Burrow being hurt. And I think that T Higgins has a lot of potential because he had only four games with single digit fantasy. And if you're coming out as a rookie and you only had four games in single, single digits, that's not bad at all. He played all 16 games. He just took 15 snaps in week one. That's also another thing that hampered him. 
he was what? He was just one of the best PPR guys. And is he going to be a top 10 fantasy wide receiver in PPR next year? Or is it more believable Baker and his wife are making a progressive commercial in real life? I'm going to go with T. Higgins. I'm trusting T. Higgins because they have a lot of weapons. They have Joe Mixon if he could stay healthy. Joe Burrow's legs also have to make a safety and a linebacker quarterback spy on him at all points. Um, Higgins was just awesome. He averaged five catches and 75 yards and half a touchdown when Joe Burrow was there. So he's getting a touchdown every other game, averaging five catches and 75 yards. So that's automatically 12 fantasy points in PPR. And then when other people were there, he just was averaging still five catches and 55 yards. He does. He has the sauce. T. Higgins knows what he's doing. He came from a winning culture in Clemson. He's a great slot receiver. He's a perfect security blanket for when Joe Burrow's getting pressured because that Bengals line's not that good, as I've said before. So I think that T. Higgins is a good look. It's a good one for him. Let's go to the next name. And I think it's more believable he'll be a top 10 fantasy wide receiver in PPR, remember, points per reception, rather than the underbake. Let's go to the next name. Joe Mixon, running back of the Bengals. So Joe Mixon had 119 yards, 420, 119 rushes for 428 yards, three touchdowns. Will he be a top 10 running back in fantasy next year? Or is it more believable that Baker saw that UFO? Well, just three months ago, uh, an American Airlines pilot said that he just saw an unidentified flying object over him when he was going to Hawaii. So, I mean, if he's kind of saying it too, and, you know, Roman historian Livy in 2018 BCE, Said the phantom ships had been gleaming in the sky. All these people have been talking about UFOs for a very long time. Baker's not that crazy. And I think that it could be more believable than Joe Mixon being good again. Because Joe Mixon, I understand. Okay, I understand. He got 42 fantasy points in one game last year. He has a lot of potential because he's 26 years old. It's just he gets so hurt. And I hate to say it because injuries shouldn't always affect how you draft it's it's last year's injury there's a lot of science and technology now and medicine for people to heal faster from acl injuries and crazy injuries as opposed to 10 20 30 40 years and so on but joe mixon gets hurt a lot and last year he only played what four or five games 119 rushes like i said only and those only he has no line the Bengals line stinks oh, like terrible. Oh, it stinks. Oh, it smells up in here. It's awful. And you know what? If you're going to, like, I, I like to follow sports injury predictor because a lot of times they that website puts in all the numbers, crunches it all down, and makes gives you the probability of them getting hurt. And a lot of times it's led me good. Um, Joe Mixon's chance of getting injured next year is 86%. 86%. And he said this year that he wasn't as good because his ankle was bugging him the whole time. So that's lingering injuries, which is probably going to linger to the next season, even though what he tore, what he tear? He tore his like his ACL? He tore, he tore his pedal foot. He had a pedal foot sprain. It was a foot injury. How do you walk without your feet? How do you run without your feet? It's not possible. So this guy is not going to finish as a top 10 running back next year. It's just... It's sad because he has so much potential and he's so good, the Oklahoma product. But his durability is terrible. He He's going to miss at least five, six games next year. So if you're okay with the running back missing five, six games, and I would, I would say differently if it was the Colts. See, if he was on the Colts, he wouldn't be getting as hurt because he has a better line. But Joe Mixon just finds ways to get hurt, and that's why I feel like it's more believable that Baker definitely, definitely <laughs> saw that UFO. Robert Tanyan, tight end of the Green Bay Packers. So Robert Tanyan's crazy because this guy wasn't doing anything all in the beginning. And then he started just going crazy towards the end of the year. So Robert Tanyan was a fourth-ranked tight end. 
because there's not that many good tight ends just in general. He has how much? 586 yards and 11 touchdowns. It's a lot of touchdowns. He scored nine of his 15 games that he played. He's very touchdown dependent. He's Is he going to finish as a top two fantasy tight end in PPR next year? Or is it more believable that Baker saw that UFO? I think I got to go with my boy Baby Kittle over here, Robert Tanyan. He has a lot of potential. Aaron Rodgers is always going to put you in the red zone. And he scored three touchdowns in a game. And he, like I said, nine touchdowns in his last 15, in his 15 games. That's a lot of fantasy touchdown production. He's very touchdown dependent, which I will give you. Because if he doesn't score a touchdown, then yeah, he'll score like eight and sometimes six. But if he scores touchdowns, there's absolutely no way that you're going to not be able to use him as a top tight end. Because, like I said, he started picking fire up at the end of the year. He most, I think it was, out of his last 10 games, only two games he did single digits. Like, he was going on a tear. He was catching touchdowns. As soon as Aaron Rodgers figured it back out with him, he was able to keep it going. That was the whole thing. Because Aaron Rodgers was get, was feeding and force feeding Devontae Adams, but then he's noticed defenses are starting to catch on, yada yada yada. But Robert Tanyan was a staple to stay. So I trust Robert Tanyan being a top two tight end more than I trust uh Baker Mayfield seeing that progressive UFO. <laughs> Next person. Baker Mayfield, quarterback of the Cleveland Browns. Wow. Look at that uncanny transitioning. It was electric. No, I'm just playing. I'm just tuning my own horn. So, Baker Mayfield was the 19th ranked quarterback in ESPN leagues, throwing 3,500 yards, well, 3,563 to be exact, 26 touchdowns, and only 8 picks. I'm really impressed, Baker. I'm really, really impressed. You definitely found the coach for you. But the thing is now, we got to take it out of your hands and run it more or you throw to the running backs more and let them make plays because we don't trust your decision making as much. So will Baker Mayfield be a top 10 quarterback next year in fantasy? Or did he see that that UFO? So he's in a competition within himself. Look, 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 look. The sheer size of the universe is huge. Our minds cannot comprehend just how vast the universe is. Scientists state that it could host like 100 to 130 billion galaxies. You ha- then have to consider the incredible number of stars within these galaxies and then the number of stars which will have planetary systems. Although it takes a very particular condition to support life, the sheer size of the universe and the number of planets that could support life will always be a staggering number. Always. The odds are therefore heavily in the favor that there's going to be existence outside of just the Earth. There are other people out there just besides the earth. And it's not that hard to believe. And that's why it wouldn't be that hard to believe that a UFO would come down more than Baker being a top 10 quarterback. You let him fall into the waiver wire. You do not draft him. You just sit back, stand wa- stand and watch. And if your quarterback gets hurt, I hope he doesn't. Then you pick him up against some good matchups. Because I think that Baker Mayfield's not terrible. And I think that run game just completely just saved him. Saved him completely. So yes, I think that Baker Mayfield saw that UFO before I see him betting on himself in real life. Justin Jefferson, wide receiver of the Minnesota Vikings. Wow. Ranked number eight last year as a rookie. I wonder who drafted him. Oh, I drafted him too, but I did trade him for DK. I'm not going to lie. I did trade him for DK. I'm a trade guy. I trade a lot. 88 catches, 1,400 yards, and 11 touchdowns. Justin Jefferson is the man. Will he finish as a top five wideout in fantasy next year? Or is it more believable that Baker wasn't wearing his glasses and saw something he thought was a UFO? (laughs) Because I've seen him throw picks on the field, and sometimes it looks like he needs glasses. I think it's more believable that Justin Jefferson's going to finish as a top five wideout next year. You draft him first or second round. I won't 
knock you on any of that. And here's why. Seven 100-yard games. Yes, rookie year, Justin Jefferson. Seven 100-yard games. You have to worry about Dalvin Cook. As long as Dalvin Cook is in that backfield, you have to put an extra defender in there because he's electric. He can go and he could catch the ball in the backfield. So you have to make sure you put one of your best guarding safeties or guarding linebackers, uh, coverage linebackers or safeties on him. He deserves and warrants that much attention. But seven 100-yard game, 1,400 yards in his rookie year, one game of 175 yards and a touchdown in another game of 166 yards. Like, come on. And then you're saying, well, but what if he has to be a wide receiver one next year? No, he doesn't. Adam Thielen's still going to get the love, and Kirk Cousins will still feed Adam Thielen a lot. Trust me. He will feed him a lot throughout the season. Justin Jefferson attracted double digit targets in like six of those ge- in six of the 16 games he played in. Justin Jefferson didn't even start going until after week 3. So if they would have known the potential of Justin Jefferson, who knows, he could have had 1600 yards this year. The LSU product is awesome. And he goes against the Lions twice a year, who he's just going to absolutely massacre. Last year, last game of the season, well, the year that just passed, he got 9 and 12 targets, 133 yards. Like, come on. This guy is going to be a top three receiver, in my opinion. But if I have to say it for the show, top five, at least. He's going to be a top five wideout. There is no doubt in my mind. Next name. Saquon Barkley, running back of the New York Giants. Only had 19 carries, 34 yards, two games. The Giants have a terrible offensive line. So is it more believable that Saquon Barkley is going to come back and be a top five running back? Or is it more believable that Baker saw that UFO? It's just so funny. Just it, It's not even that he saw a UFO and that's funny because that's been a thing, but that he's... Baker Mayfield, and you just see him do all these goofy commercials, and you're like, okay, this guy. Yeah, this guy saw a UFO. I'm so sure. Oh, and his wife, the one that's in on it with him on his commercials to always get clout? Yeah, I don't think so. But Baker may be on to a point. Every single, you know, couple years, they always add more and more planets to our planetary system that, you know, the scientists just do their science on. I'm not a scientist and a sciencer, so don't ask me questions like that. But there are an increasing number of planets. In the last 10 years or so, hundreds of new exoplanets, planets outside of our solar system, have been discovered. And many of these are gas giants. And other are inhospitable planets where you can't be. But I'm still saying, there's extra planets that are being found today. And there's probably going to be extra planets that are going to be found another 10 years from now. We have not touched the whole solar system yet. We still have to build more technology, to do the science, to do the math, whatever these mathers and scientists do, and they have to find these more planets. So since there's a possibility of more planets, there's still a possibility of more life. And we don't know. That's why UFOs are more believable than the hurt Saquon, who got hurt in the second game of the season, is going to be a top five running back. He had a 2019 ankle injury. uh, injury That limited him. He even said like, oh, hey, I think my, um, my ankle like tampered my game, my season. When when you guys oh you know when you guys all drafted me number one and or number two, like in 2019 and this year, yeah 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 no I, my ankle is hurting, so his legs are always going to be hurting now. How is it going to get better? Oh he'll keep getting his legs strong right? No, it's going to be the Bo Jackson effect. Bo Jackson didn't get hurt because he wasn't strong enough, or anything of that matter. If anything, he was too strong when he came down. The pure pressure he was bringing down on his leg when he got tackled from behind by the Cincinnati Bengals in the 80s, that pure pressure just from all of that muscle he had in his legs is what hurt him and what met and ruptured his like his uh, his knee. And then he wasn't able to play again, and then you know the rest of the story. So Saquon Barkley is strong, has you know tree trunks of legs, but it's always going to be his downfall because he runs so hard and strong, and they're going to feed him like... Not Saquon Barkley, like Christian McCaffrey. So he's always going to get that love. So he's going to get the ball a lot, more chances of getting hurt. Giants off- offensive line stinks. No, he's not going to finish a top five running back. Baker, 
knows that there's extra planets abroad, and that's why he, he said he saw a UFO. And the last name, Jonathan Taylor, running back of the Colts. The number 7th ranked running back in ESPN PPR leagues, 232 rushes, 1,169 yards, and 11 touchdowns. Will he be a top 2 fantasy running back next year, or is it more believable that Baker's doing his little dance in the locker room after he takes that L and looked up and said, oh, hey, a UFO, hey, let me hit my shmoney, shmoney, hey, hey. I think it's more believable that Jonathan Taylor's going to be a top two running back, and here's why. That offensive line is awesome. Carson Wentz is either going to do what Phillip Rivers did, if not, or a tiny bit better. A little over 4,000 yards, who cares? Still not MVP caliber, Carson Wentz. He's just Carson Wentz. And... That offensive line is awesome. 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 Yeah, I know that's annoying. Sorry. It's awesome. It's really, really good. Ryan, get better <laughs> synonyms, I know. But Jonathan Taylor, they are just they were just scratching the surface on him last year, and they were just barely figuring out what this man really could do. Jonathan Taylor, in the last one, two, three, four, five, six games, Six games of the season, he dropped 15 fantasy points, 22 rushes for 90 yards. That's when they're like, okay, let's figure it out. Then he came out with a tear. 13 rushes, 91 yards, 22 fantasy points. 20 rushes, 150 yards, two touchdowns, 30 fantasy points. The man scored seven touchdowns in the last four weeks. And he was going against the Steelers in one of those weeks and still scored 19 fantasy points. On the Jaguars, who he's going to play twice a year, he dropped 38 fantasy points. And the Raiders, he dropped 30. Like, come on. This guy's crazy good. Next year, I am drafting him with my top four picks. No doubt about it. Just because I know Naeem Hines is in his way. And I know there's still a little bit of Jordan Wilkins love. But trust me, they're figuring out the sauce on Jonathan Taylor. You're not going to just... Throw him in there all the time as a rookie like their Saquon. You're going to put him in. Even Christian McCaffrey his first year. He was being, he was still giving, I drafted him the first year he came out. So he was giving you nine point games, nine point games. I imagine Christian McCaffrey was giving you nine point games now. You're like, ugh. No, he gives me 20, 30, 40 point fantasy games because he's, he's awesome. Why do I keep saying that word? But Jonathan Taylor is going to do that because they're figuring him out. They're going to put him more in the offensive schemes. They're going to figure out a way to pencil him in more. They're going to cut down on the carries they do with Jordan Wilkins. Give Naeem Hines the ball. Oh, I forgot Marlon Mack. They're not resigning. So that's how you know the confidence is in him. From week 11 on, he had nothing less than, oh, well, he had 13 carries one week. But he still had 22 fantasy points that week. He had nothing less than 16 rushes. So he's rushing 16 to 22 times a game. The Jaguars rushed 30 times in the game. Jonathan Taylor is a force to be reckoned with, and I you should have him on the top of all your fantasy boards. That is the end of Is It More Believable Than Baker Seen a UFO? I had a great time. I love fantasy football, as you can tell. I'm trying to help you guys be champions. That's all it is. And I didn't mean guys as just guys. I mean females and little baby men out there. I'm just kidding. But... I'm helping you guys become champions first, and that's the only thing that matters to me. I do not care about, oh, I'm trying to give you some some of this just so I can get some clout and do this because I like this. But no, I'm giving you the hard facts. I am brutally honest about things, and I'm and I'm quite honestly blunt with people. So as you can tell how I am talking, but I'm just going to be here. Next week, I'm going to give you some good content. We're going to talk about everything that's happening to you in the NFL. Maybe I'll give you a list. Check out my video that's going to come out on Twitter at the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. So thank you for listening to GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review that really helps us. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, and Twitter, that would be much appreciated. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Fantasy Football Podcast. 
part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.